You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 13, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, small airway particle deposition. Our presenter is Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser. He's the D. Lyons, Missouri Endowed Chair in Immunology Research at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. So welcome back to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we're now joined by Dr. Uh, Lanny Rosen, sir. Dr. Rosenwasser is the D. Lyons Missouri Endowed Chair in Immunology Research. He's a professor uh, here at Children's Mercy in Pediatrics and Internal Medicine uh, here in the Allergy and Immunology section. Uh, and he's uh, uh, agreed to talk with us this morning about particle deposition and small airways in asthma. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy. Uh, Dr. Rosenwasser, take it away. Thanks a lot, Jay. Well, um, the subject is an important subject, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about it from the perspective of um, the activities that I have in the World Allergy Organization. We've had a small airways working group there for the past two and a half years where we provided um, uh, presentations by a very distinguished faculty, some of whom are on the WOW steering committee for uh, small airways, uh, and some of whom are uh, obviously recognized experts in the area of small airways. This is something that in the last 15 years has uh, influenced some of the thinking related to difficult to treat asthma as we'll go through and we'll let you know uh, exactly how that field developed. Um, as one of my duties in the World Allergy Organization, I'm chair of this uh, small airways working group. We have a steering committee that has uh, very prominent uh, people from all over the world, Asia, Europe, South America. Uh, uh, and uh, the group ranges from basic scientists, physiologists, to pathologists, to clinicians and translational researchers on issues related to small airways. What we've been doing for the past two years is getting major symposia placed at uh, international and national conferences. And uh, we're in the midst of negotiating to develop a uh, similar program in North America to the regional and, uh, and local uh, society meetings. So, so maybe COLA is the first one that you are yeah, planning it at. We're very pleased to be able to talk about the small airways uh, here at, at COLA. Uh, one of what, what we have in the working group is uh, the web editor of our working group uh, for small airways is Vez Dima who's also on the uh, web editorial board for WAO. Vez uh, was trained up in Omaha at Creighton and is currently on the faculty at the University of Chicago and has an interest in uh, aspects of uh, um, social media and technology in terms of disseminating allergy issues and asthma issues. Uh, Vez um, has been doing this now for about four or five months. Uh, he uh, provides a monthly update with a literature review related to small airways and uh, has been working on developing an interactive blog uh, concerning small airways as well. And, uh, having him do that job has been very, very uh, helpful uh, to disseminate ideas and publications from a wide variety of, of sources on small airways. He's got an amazing website, too, if you ever get a chance to yeah, to visit it, it's just got lots of information. Yeah, very, it, very insightful and innovative. Might be a good subject for COLA in terms of the utilization. to talk about the yeah. use of social media. Social media and web technology for uh, for allergy. Anyhow, uh, my disclosures have been appropriately pared down to the ones that I've done in the last year and are listed here. Uh, none of them have any uh, conflict of interest with any of the small airways which, as you'll see, involve medications that, uh, and devices that cross a wide range of pharmaceutical interests. But I will not be speaking about anything that I have a conflict with. Uh, the learning objectives for this presentation is to understand the concept of particle deposition, understand how particle size impacts deposition of inhaled asthma medicines, 
and understand the relationship of particle size deposition and physiologic responses of the small airways. So there are three topics that we will go through. Uh, I always like to do a touchstone of the way in which uh, I've had any kind of direct or peripheral uh, involvement in a particular field, because it always makes more sense to me when I tell it from that point of view. At least I understand it a little bit better. So when Colin Reisner and Rohit Kadio were fellows of ours in Denver, uh, they did a study that looked at about four or five different nebulization uh, machines. We had a particle lab in our clinical translational unit that uh, Harold Nelson oversaw that we could look at particle size output from these different nebulizers. And you can see here it ranged from uh, different uh, forms, uh, five or so of the uh, different uh, nebulized machines. And at low flow rates, there's one machine that seemed to have a much higher percentage of particle size that was respirable, uh, whereas at uh, higher flow, that same machine didn't do as well as some of the other ones uh, that had more of a, a higher percentage of respirable particles. And this was published in the annals now over 10 years ago. Uh, so this is really about all I knew about particle size prior to being involved with the Small Airways Working Group. But thinking about it, uh, the disease process in asthma, uh, what's developed from the work in research in small airways, is that the asthma process, namely the immune inflammatory process that are in uh, airway branches 3 to 10, which are the major conducting airways that are involved in obstruction and asthma, uh, that same process occurs through the entire airway. So the larynx and the first or second bifurcation, the main stem bronchi, have the same degree of uh, Th2 mediated inflammation that you have in the transmitting bronchioles. And then, as you'll see, all the way to the small airway, uh, that same inflammation in the same pattern exists. So it's not just one airway when if you compare the upper and lower airway, but the entire airway, not just the, the part of the airway that's involved in obstruction, has the pathogenesis or the pathogenetic uh, profile or footprint uh, that one sees. And you can see here, uh, you know, there's 23 divisions of the uh, airway going all the way out to alveoli. Uh, most of the transmitting airways are between 2 to 3 to 10 in terms of the kinds of uh, airflow obstruction we generally see in asthmatic in terms of the physiologic translation. So uh, in the terms of a definition of small airways, those are airways that are less than 2 millimeters in diameter. The inflammation in airway remodeling and asthma extends to those small airways, and as we'll see, it could be that these, this small airway source of inflammation may contribute to difficult to control asthma, especially if the treatments are mismatched to the deposition that one would hope for uh, if one could get at the small airways in asthma. Um, this started in two ways. The co-chair of our working group uh, is Monica Kraft, who was studying inflammation in airways in a nocturnal asthma model that her mentor, Richard Martin, at National Jewish, oversaw. And she was doing bronchoscopies of asthmatics at 4 p.m. and 4 a.m. And I think, uh, as a fellow, she may have gotten a little bored just doing those uh, bronchoscopies at 4 a.m. So they included in a subset of their studies a transbronchial biopsy along with the bronchoscopies at 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. And lo and behold, the same kind of uh, inflammation that they saw in the standard bronchial biopsy was also present in the small airways. And uh, that was published at about the same time that Qutayba Hamid had a surgical study in which uh, 10 controls and 6 patients with asthma uh, had surgical lung specimens that were looked at. The asthmatics were under control and being operated on for another indication terms of their lung process, and they therefore were able to provide a, a, pop, a, a pathologic specimen that could be looked at. And again, the same kind of process was seen in the uh, small airways, less than two millimeters, that was seen in uh, the transmitting bronchi. bronchi. And you can see here in airways less than two millimeters, the same degree of mast cells uh, 
eosinophil marker increases, MBP marker increases of eosinophilia, and T cell numbers were increased in the airways less than two millimeters in a manner exactly equivalent to those airways greater than two millimeters. And clearly the asthmatics had that increase in these kinds of markers and cells as opposed to the controls in this pathologic study uh, that Hamid did in 1997. Uh, and as I mentioned, the developing ideas were that there were no significant differences in lung function in these individuals. But if you looked at more sophisticated measures of airway physiology, such as closing volume, closing capacity, other, other measures of resistance and capacity, capacitance in difficult to treat asthmatics, uh, they were entirely different. And the hypothesis that developed from this was that the small airway pathology um, may not have been influenced by the delivery of anti-inflammatory medications that based on particle size did not reach that small airway. One of the things as allergists when we do uh, airway sampler, air sampling with an Anderson sampler is to identify particles of various size and indeed, the smaller the size of the particles that one could pick up in an Anderson sample in terms of pollen would have a difference in terms of what part of the lung it would penetrate. So if you had a very small um, sized uh, particle, less than two millimeters, uh, clearly you can penetrate into the alveoli uh, with a small uh, particle. Most particles that are uh, allergen related are less than five millimeters in terms of their respirability, but some of the pollen particles that are seen on a sample are much, much higher. The ones that you can see that are much bigger clearly are not going to be penetrating to the large part of the airway, although some of the allergens may be uh, absorbed, especially the water-soluble ones from the larger pollen particles that get to the oropharynx. So some of the same issues concerning airway branching and airway size is reflected in terms of particles that one would see in an Anderson sample looking for um, particles of pollen or particles of uh, materials that would include not only airway or air pollutants, but also even perennial uh, allergens that might be part of a particle makeup. So uh, there is a correlation between particle size in allergy and uh, penetration into the lungs as well. The place where this uh, really uh, makes an impact in terms of treatment of asthmatics is with the particle size of the various kinds of inhaled treatments that we have for asthma. So if you look at these various kinds of uh, materials, if you look at the di discus, which would take its own propionate, you generate a, a particle size that's greater than five uh, micrometer in the diameter. Uh, with HFA, beclomethasone, you're having a particle size at 1.1 um, micrometer. Uh, and then you can see here uh, various other preparations, a CFC-driven triamcinolone, uh, budesonide delivered by uh, terbuhaler, a CFC-driven flunicilide, or, uh, or uh, beclomethasone have larger particles. Uh, a CFC fluticasone propionate is a little bit smaller compared to discus. And as you'll see, this has to do with the same correlation with various lung depositions. So the larger particles had less direct deposition in the lung when these steroid preparations and these particles are inhaled, but the one that was the smallest had the highest percentage of lung deposition. So the HFA beclomethasone had 56% deposition, the CFC beclomethasone only 4%, and you can see here the percentage is graded in with the different uh, kinds of devices and and, uh, and materials as well. There's a lot of um, contributors to the actual uh, generation of a particle and a particle size. Some of it involves how much moisture there is as the particle gets developed. Some of it has to do with the actual intrinsic structure of the steroid itself. Some of it has to do with the carrier. So when CFC is being utilized, generates a much larger particle than when HFA is utilized as the, as the carrier uh, for the particle to be developed and, uh, and deposited. 
Is that because it's more volatile, or what, what's that? I think there's a variety of different physical chemical constraints that contribute to the whole thing. And usually what's done is the preparations are made, and then they're measured, and, and you know clearly they can tinker with some of it to make a smaller particle to get better deposition. But I think there's limits to what they can do with it based on the device and based on the uh, chemistry of the molecule and the carrier used to to generate the, the particle to be deposited. Um, another way to look at this is through an evaluation of uh, shells. Uh, so if one looks with, with um, measurements of uh, molecules, for example, inhaled in the lung, the outer shell would represent the smallest airways because it's the most periphery of the lung, where the you have up to the 23rd lung division of the, of the airway. The innermost shell would involve the trachea and the main stem bronchi. So shell 1 through 6 would be an in decreasing size of the airways in terms of caliber. And the molecules that are direct deposited in the inner shell would be larger ones. The ones in the outer shell uh, would be uh, smaller particles that could get to the alveoli. If one looks at uh, lung deposition of HFA seclesinide, uh, clearly there's a dose, or not a dose, there's a size-dependent deposition to the outer shell where the percentage of uh, depositions are higher. In, uh, and this is done not in asthmatics, but in, in normal volunteers. Similar um, uh, measurements in asthmatics have been done with HFA inhaled corticosteroids. So in this circumstances, HFA are, is used as the um, carrier uh, for the deposition of all these inhaled steroids, ranging from uh, bacomethasone through flunicilide, budesonide, triopsinolone, fluticasone propionate, um, and uh, seclesinide. And you can see the HFA bacomethasone and the HFA seclesinide have about a 50% lung deposition uh, difference in some of these other kinds of preparations. But they are all inhaled HFA, so they're being compared. Um, actual measurements of direct deposition with technetium-labeled uh, medication was done uh, in normal volunteers as well, published uh, 10 years ago in the, in the Blue Journal, in which nine healthy subjects were randomized to receive inhaled uh, technetium-99 labeled HFA vecomethasone or CFC vecomethasone or CFC fluticasone. The work done these years ago with the CFC is now moot because obviously CFC is not part of the treatment armamentarium. But some of the particle definitions with uh, discus, dry powder inhalers, pressurized, uh, even HFA, don't measure up to some of these ones that are 50%. You saw that uh, circumstance where even the HFA pressurized uh, meter dose inhalers, which were utilized in that comparison, there were still percentage differences in a lot of those uh, in a lot of those uh, study subjects. In this, you can see in the same subject, these nine normal volunteers were crossed over to the three different possibilities. Uh, the HFA beclomethasone had a 53% lung deposition with a technetium labeled beclomethasone. Uh, Fluticasone uh, CFC was only 13%, and CFC beclomethasone was only 4%, with the majority in the upper airway, as you can see in, in these two circumstances. There's still some in the upper airway, obviously, even with the HFA with the smaller particles. But the lung penetration uh, is... is uh, much better with the smaller particles. And since it's the same individual, um, differences in terms of spacers or techniques or some of these other things are, are relatively canceled out. And it's interesting that with such a small amount of deposition that there's still clinical efficacy. Absolutely. And it's entirely possible that absorbing it through the upper airway is enough to generate a response in the lower airway as well uh, through a systemic route. Um, the problem with that is that some of these medications probably have a first pass effect. So even if you absorb it in the upper airway, some of it may be being inactivated as it passes through the liver before it can get to the to the lower airway. So, so 
a lot of ins and outs with this kind of things. I don't know if that's all true. There's a lot of ins and outs in our interpretation. Not a lot of, not a lot of uh, formal proof of exactly where the different uh, pathways go in terms of this process. But you know, the data are the data, and there's some aspect to thinking that the greater lung deposition is probably going to have a greater efficacy. Although, you know, in terms of some of the outcomes, that's turning out to be true, as I'll show you. And this is just the conclusion from this study that HFA beclomethasone uh, is a more even deposition and therefore reaches uh, more into the lungs and the other, other things that were studied in these volunteers. Um, so, I, as I said, I like to do a little touchstone on some of these things. There are a couple of dozen different trials of different aspects of the higher percentage lung deposition preparations, both with bethclomethasone and seclesonide. Torpong Thanganarm is, uh, was a research postdoc in Denver, worked in my lab on some aspects of TGO beta genetics, but he also did a clinical trial with Harold Nelson uh, at the time he was here. Torpong is from Mayadol Medical School in Bangkok, and he went back there. Uh, Pakit Vishamund, who did his pediatrics training here at Children's Mercy, and his pediatric allergy training at National Jewish, and is the head of the allergy department at Mayadol University, he is, was Torpong's mentor, one of the reasons he came to Denver to work. Uh, so uh, I'll use this as another touchstone. Looking at HFA beclomethasone or CFC fluticasone, in patients who came with uh, poorly controlled, moderately severe asthma to the clinic in Denver. And this is the study design where asthma not controlled on medium to high dose inhaled steroids were uh, run in and then randomized either to an HFA beclomethasone at 160 twice daily, and there were 20 subjects in this, prop, in this group, or to CFC fluticasone propionate, uh, and there were 10 in this group who got 220 micrograms in the morning and 110 uh, in the afternoon. And this was in a period of time that um, the uh, CFC fluticasone or Flovent was still uh, available as an alternative. This is obviously randomized but not double-blinded. Uh, it's a randomized open label alternative in the moderately severe asthmatics who are not well controlled prior to this randomization. Further characterization of the study design is here. You can see in the screening period, spirometry was done pre and post bronchodilator, and plethysmography and closing volume were measured, which is a critical point of this. These asthmatics who were not under good control were having some measures that were looking at their small airway function in terms of uh, physiology. And uh, spirometry was measured on the three visits outlined previously, and then the physiology was measured at the last visit, which was, whatever, 16 weeks? I don't know if it was 12 or 16. 12 weeks after um, randomization to either HFA beclomethasone or CFC fluticasone. And you can see here, um, in terms of the comparison of the patient groups, and this is uh, the difficulty with small numbers, 20 versus 10, with one dropout, it's 20 versus 9. Um, Pre-treatment, uh, the asthma scores were much higher, and albuterol usage was much higher in the group that was randomized to the HFA beclomethasone as opposed to the CFTC fluticasone. So this comparison um, is a little bit off because it looked like the HFA beclomethasone subjects were a little bit uh, more uh, involved and more severe than the ones who are in the CFC fluticasone group. So during the blinded period, five out of the 20 subjects receiving HFA uh, beclomethasone, and zero out of the 10 experienced exacerbations that required a short burst of three days of prednisone. And the subjects were tested at least one month following their last prednisone in terms of the physiology at day or at week 12. So they all had been off prednisone more than four weeks before that week 12 physiology was done. The post-treatment parameters in the five subjects fell one standard deviations uh, compared to the other 15 HFA beclomethasone subjects. So if one looks at the closing volume, there's clearly um, a, a, uh, 
a change in the uh, pre and post uh, group in terms of uh, uh, the uh, individuals who had CFC fluticasone. But it, looking at closing volume via capacity, perhaps a better measurement of small airway. There is clearly a statistically significant uh, improvement as in residual volume as well, and FEF 2575 in the group who uh, had HFA beclometasone. And this just shows that uh, in a bar graph form showing the improvement in uh, FEF 2575 in the group that had beclometasone, whereas there was no statistical difference in the CFC fluticasone group. Uh, and again, uh, looking at the closing volume vital capacity ratio, significantly better in the group who had uh, HFA beclometasone <coughs> and not a difference. Uh, small airway patency, again, pre-bronchodilators were comparable in both groups. Uh, and this uh, measurement uh, was not different after treatment. Uh, in terms of uh, peak flow and results diary, obviously the group with HFA beclometasone had a um, many more exacerbations. So albuterol usage was clearly higher in this group. And so it went from 4 to 0 in the CFC fluticasone. Uh, and, but the drop in the albuterol uh, usage and the HFA beclometasone was also comparable and statistically significant in this measurement. So in patients with moderate to severe persistent asthma, not controlled on medium to high dose of inhaled steroids, the addition of the HFA beclometasone provided greater effects on some of the measurements of the small airways uh, than CFC fluticasone. So um, a similar study was also undertaken uh, by Hoshino published in Allergology International, which is the Japanese journal, in which seclesonide and fluticasone propionate uh, were utilized in a manner similar, uh, at slightly lower doses in terms of the fluticasone, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, treatment of uh, moderate asthma. In this uh, open-label parallel group study, the same design as the Torpon study, looking at 160 uh, QD of seclesonide versus fluticasone, 100 micrograms BID for a treatment period of eight weeks with an eight-week run-in on fluticasone in these moderate asthmatics. And uh, they used impulse oscillometry as a measure of small and large airway function in these subjects as well. And R5 is a measure of both large and small airway resistance, 5 megahertz for the oscillometry. R20 would re measure airway resistance uh, in large airways because the higher megahertz, I guess, correlates better with uh, airway function in the larger airways. And small airway resistance can be, uh, therefore, uh, calculated as R5 minus R20. One could also look at capacitance, either by looking at X5, which would be capacitance in the small airways, uh, by impulse oscillometry, and area, the area under the curve of low frequency reactants uh, seen in measures of capacitance. So there are a number of physiologic outcomes utilizing impulse oscillometry. It's being done in this uh, study, again, comparison, comparing fluticasone with sequesonide. And you can see here the measure of the small airway resistance is improved with sequesonide as opposed to fluticasone in this eight-week trial. The measurement in terms of larger airway uh, resistance uh, is no different in uh, either the sequesonide or the fluticasone group, but the group measurement of, uh, of small airway resistance clearly is statistically improved uh, in the um, sequesonide group. Uh, capacitance, capa uh, capacitance was also measured and you can see here, airway low frequency reactants and capacitive reactants were both statistically improved on the uh, sequesonide with no difference in the fluticasone. So again, a couple of other physiologic measurements uh, based on impulse oscillometry that demonstrated that the sequesonide as opposed to the fluticasone 
had a better improvement on those physiologic measures of small airway function. Um, if one looks at eosinophils in sputum in these two po populations, uh, you can show that those individuals who were treated with seclezonide had a significant drop in sputum eosinophilia uh, over the eight weeks, whereas the group that had uh, treatment with fluticasone had no change in their uh, sputum eosinophilia over that same eight-week period. And if one looks at ACT scores, uh, there's an improvement in the uh, um, in the uh, sequesonide group and no difference in the fluticasone group, although this difference in AT ACT score may not be clinically significant, even though it reaches statistical significance. So in summary, the Hoshino study follows up and shows some of the same results that the Torpong study did. Both of them are flawed, small, non-placebo controlled trials, but they both compare um, preparations that probably have better airway penetration versus other preparations that don't. And they clearly demonstrate some physiologic changes, uh, plethysmography in the Torpong study and by impulse oscillometry in the Hoshino study to show that better penetration led to better physiologic outcomes in terms of uh, small airways. So uh, the Hoshino paper does support some of the same ideas that the uh, Torpong paper uh, reached. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, we'd like to get as many small airway papers that people have for the World Allergy Organization Journal. We are in the midst of getting PubMed or PubMed Central designation for the journal this year. We anticipate that we should be able to do that. And we're working on, on that goal for the WOW Journal. It's a good journal, and there's some very interesting things from around the world. So uh, COLA gives me a chance to, to actually drum up business, because I am the editor for that journal as well. And uh, we are also having a WOW meeting in Hyderabad, India in December this year on severe allergies and severe asthma, new strategies. It will be a very exciting conference. We had one of these international scientific conferences two years ago in Dubai. And our world congresses are every other year. In 2013, we'll be in Milan with the European Academy uh, on a joint congress. Uh, we had our congress in Cancun last year. And the year that I'll be president of WAO, we'll have an international scientific conference in Rio de Janeiro in 2014. And the World Allergy Congress will be in October of 2015 in Seoul, Korea. So we have a lot of conferences that are coming up. And you can be sure that any kind of new information concerning small airways will be reported uh, at those meetings as well. So be glad to answer any questions about small airways or particles. You know, the, the purpose of this uh, small airway committee is, well, what was it? The Educational, predominantly. Uh, and what we've done predominantly is have symposia and lectures placed at conferences um, around the world. We had a small airway symposium at ERS in Amsterdam last September. Uh, we've been in Iyaki the past three years, London and uh, and uh, Istanbul, and uh, and if you could summarize, Geneva. if you could summarize the message that you're trying to relate in a very briefly, what what is it that you want us to know yeah, about particles? It's um, predominantly well. With this part, my presentation is self-explanatory. I think uh, the idea being that the better the airway penetration, the better the influence on physiology. Um, that the entire airway is a target for remodeling as well as inflammation and immune reactivity. I think some of the immune reactivity probably is not just the intrinsic part of asthma, but it may be related to having particles that are the right size that can carry allergens and other things that can trigger responses all the way down to the lower airway. So I think when you have the season, for example, for tree pollen or grass pollen in people who are sensitive, even without a major exacerbation that brings them to the ER or to their doctor with an exacerbation, 
that season they're going to be having more reactivity. And the reactivity isn't just in the nose or upper airway or in the larynx. Some of it undoubtedly will penetrate all the way down to the alveoli. And if you wipe out the inflammation and ignore the alveoli, um, maybe you can get away with that for most asthmatics or people with allergic rhinitis with only minimal airway response. But the difficult to control asthmatics, that last bit of inflammation there may be something that's a critical piece that needs to be controlled before you can get them into a good functional uh, state. Is it a given maximum that the more deposition deeper is always better? Yeah, I think I don't think it's absolutely proven in any study that I've seen that's a lead pipe cinch, but the implication from all these studies suggests that. Part of the issue is that it would be very hard to prove. You'd be having to do transbronchial biopsies in these patients who are improved physiologically, and then you make the correlation with ACT. Uh, so you have that would be a pretty involved and pretty aggressive study. I, I think, you know, I, I mean, all due respect to Monica Kraft, but it took a lot of guts to, I think, at 4 a.m. do a transbronchial biopsy on these patients who right. had asthma. Are there physiologic differences in different parts or sizes of the airway that might be important? I mean, do middle-sized airways have different yeah. inflammatory or physiologic things that occur as opposed to smaller ways? And might it be useful to perhaps target different agents to different sizes of airways? Yeah, no, I think that's a reasonable idea once you start thinking about it. Um, on our steering committee, we have Charlie Irvin, who's an outstanding physiologist. And, you know, I know he thinks about these issues about doing <coughs> regional measurements. So, you know, these things that are barely in my limits of understanding, like impulse oscillometry and a variety of these right, other right. measurements, they're thinking of doing these things regionally. They're looking at fractionated helium movement in certain parts of the airway. But I don't think they've gotten to the point of targeting a part of the airway with the unit. Different treatment. parts. So, for example, if you had a combination of a bronchodilator and an inhaled steroid, and you decided that the medium-sized airways was the best target for the bronchodilator, but the small airways was the best size for the anti-inflammatory, could you engineer uh, something that would uh, deliver larger particles of bronchodilator and smaller particles of steroid in the same device? Yeah. Is that technically feasible? That would be... Uh, certainly something that, I don't know if it's technically feasible, but that would be an interesting goal. And I'm sure it's one that some people have certainly thought about. Although, ever since I've been on this working group, I think I've met the people at the cutting edge in this stuff. And I don't know if there's enough general support, either from pharmaceuticals or from funding agencies like NIH or some of the mm. European community, European Union, that would fund that kind of research to find out. But that's an important question because it's certainly, but you know, you then get back to the caveat that almost all these studies are done with single agents and different devices. So if you start to get a discus that has both a, a, a LABA as well as a steroid, again, that's going to change the particle configuration based on the chemistry. So there's a lot of work that has to be done just on the combinations as well. We probably need to get away from this idea of studying preparations for marketing. I mean, drug companies have different devices and so on, but from a physiologic perspective, we need to have a single device that can be tuned and calibrated to deliver specific agents to different places for physiologic measurements. And forget, forget about what the different brands of inhaler deliver, but figure out what actually works, and then that might give guidance to the device gen developers commercially. Yeah. No, I think from a purely rational approach to drug design and treatment, that would be the best way to go. Yeah. But it doesn't develop that way. And, no, it doesn't. But, and, you know, with all due respect to drug research, I mean, you know, you get a preparation with HFA <coughs> and beclomethasone, you get particle deposition that's 4%, but then all of a sudden you put it into HFA, it's 58%. You know, I mean, then that was totally unpredictable. It's something that None of the regular drug companies worked on it. Was actually a finding from um, from 3M because they Spherical were empirical observation. Yeah, well, and they were looking for ways to get around the CFC issue. And uh, you know, I think uh, Brock, Brock has impatiently had his hand up, and then sorry, we'll let you yeah, sure. so go ahead, Brock. Did you have a comment? Oh, yeah. <laughs>
not impatiently. Okay. Uh, impatiently. Just, just one little question uh, on this. Everything you know is, is fairly rational that uh, you know what you're proposing, but the cyclonesylide. Uh, it seemed to me that its significance was gained by just a few patients. There was three or four really good responders, and the rest of them were pretty flatlined. And yeah. I'm wondering if they could, uh, if they it mentioned anything in particular about those patients with the oscillometry. Yeah, no. In terms of um, stratifying response, that you you have that up possibility in almost every kind of clinical trial. In these two, the Hoshino study and Torpong study, you know, a total of 29 in one and 30 in the other. It's such small numbers that that kind of stratification, apart for, from a glitch in terms of a subgroup not knowing how to use the device or whatever, it's mm -hmm. not likely that you could stratify it in a meaningful way. But that's always the thought, you know, that if you have uh, 15 people in a trial and only five are driving the response that looks positive, what's that difference? And it certainly mm -hmm. could fit into this category as well in terms of um, other factors that might influence that difference. So the point's mm -hmm. well taken. The problem is it's hard to get a lot of answers in this stuff. I mean, this has been 15 years, and apart from all the the drug device and the particles and everything like that that's been developed. I mean, you know, this is essentially just a, um, a, a uh, an accidental finding. I mean, you know, it was mm. Monica goofing around at 4 a.m. and doing bronchoscopy <laughs> biopsies and Hamid doing a couple of autopsy, or not autopsy, surgical specimen studies at the same time to uncover the idea that small airways are contributing to this. Uh, the, you know, that, I guess that, that didn't sound good. She was doing <laughs> studies and then he was doing autopsies. It just sounded bad. Yeah, no, no. I, well, they, were no on, no they connection. weren't on the same patient. That's okay. right. right. One was in Canada and the other was in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to ask some comment, Dr. Argo? I was just going to ask, you know, like a lot of the studies that, well, the one that you presented and a lot of have compared, like you showed CFC, Bethlehemethasone, with um, HFA, Bethlehemethasone, and HFA, or sorry, CFC, Fluticasone, but as you showed before, the HFA version of Fluticasone is actually a pretty small particle size as well. It's that same yeah. 2.4 or whatever, and it has about 50% deposition. So are there a lot of studies that really just compare head-to-head -head HFA, since that's really what we use now, and all these studies are from, like you said, yeah. so long ago? Well, uh, they're not so long ago for some of us, so long ago for others. <laughs> but I, I think... Um, you know, there is a pure, the sequelinite study that was 2007 compared all HFA. Right. But as Jay points out, that's kind of an artificial thing to do because, you know, maybe we should just have one device that should be allowed because that's the best device. But I'm not sure that there is one device that's the best device, and it may be for one because kind of chemical, well... To a, to a device that you could tune different particle yeah. sizes and then study those, something like that. Well, but if the chemistry of the steroids are different, because that's probably the explanation for what you're bringing up about the difference mm -hmm. here. If you can, um, you know, uh, alter the chemistry, then maybe you can alter the particle size. And, it, you know, just because beclomethasone goes from 4 to 56, you know, just with the fluticasone, what does it go from, like, 6 to 12 or something, you know, it's still not enough. But we know for the majority of asthmatics, fluticasone is a good treatment. The inhaled fluticasone works. So probably for the majority of asthmatics, getting the anti-inflammatory all the way down to the small airways is not absolutely necessary. But there is probably a percentage of asthma patients with that critical amount of inflammation down in the alveoli are able to ride an escalator up to the airways that get obstructed. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I know that we've talked about bronchodilators and uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, steroids and beta agonists as the two drugs that are inhaled. Is it conceivable that other agents could be developed as inhalation agents that we currently don't use or think of as being inhaled? You know, there is a bunch of data on some of the receptor antagonists that are being developed as biotherapeutics. Some of them have been trialed and tried as inhaled. Um, they've been in trials where there's, they've been less than effective mm. once they get to the large trial study. The, um, 
the FC receptor antagonist for IL-4, or rather the IL-4 receptor hooked to an FC receptor, has been tried in an inhaled form, but the IL-4 inhibition trial failed. So, you know, you can have people inhale uh, antibodies as well as proteins, and those particles have a different set of immunochemistry and deposition uh, <coughs> profiles, so they're going to work a little differently as well. But, the, but I, you know, whenever these antibodies have been developed, there's always been a discussion of the potential of using them as uh, inhaled therapy. And in some of the ad boards that I've been involved in, some companies are willing to consider that, and they've actually done some of the legwork to do that kind of an approach, and others are more resistant. They're like to just give injections or infusions. So there was a for biologics it's been a consideration. Uh, there, there was a pharmaceutical rep that came by my office of, you know, a couple, about a month ago with uh, one of the new new kinds of inhalers that you apparently you pump it up and then it makes a mist that you in, you just breathe in. So it's like most of it's like a pressurized canister that forms a nebulizer mist that you in, inhale. Are you familiar, familiar with that? I don't know what it was called. I don't, I think teotropium would be. Was it from? Yeah, no, yeah. that's right. You're, it may be for. It was a new device. Spiriva type drug, teotropium. Yeah. I'm trying to avoid brand names, but. Uh, yeah, no. Well, but, but you're you familiar with that one. device? Yeah. Is that? No, no. I, I I've heard it, but I haven't seen it or used it. But I've heard of that for the teotropium preps. Yeah, um, Look like, interesting. Yeah, um, when teotropium, it's being developed. I think to potentially uh, give it to kids below the age of 12. Mm. So they're doing a study between age 2 and 12 with teotropium, and I think they're using that device because the ones that are used in adults where you put a capsule in and puncture the capsule and then breathe in right, right. particles from the capsule, mm -hmm. not thought to be a viable um, well, for device little, for kids. For little kids, dry powders are not because they suck on it and then they yeah. blow into it, but they don't inhale from it, so you really can't do that. But that's the other question. What about the device what about for teotropium? I think is being developed be, for the for the pediatric for indication. Yeah. But what about dry powder? I mean, we for, we we had meter dose inhalers, and then this dry powder stuff got introduced about 15 years ago, and it was going to be all the rage, and everybody's going to switch to dry powders, and and now it seems like it's kind of switching back to to HFA meter dose inhalers again. Did, are dry powder inhalers passe? Have they been just not shown to be very effective? Or what, what's the well, story? I think they've, they've been effective in clinical trials to some degree. And they were thought to be easier to use because you didn't have to worry about issues related to a spacer, the correct kind of ways or mechanisms for inhalation. So right. they were easier that way to just plug in. But when you actually start to look at the particle deposition, we just touch the periphery of oh, it the in this discus. presentation. Yeah, the discus and these other mechanisms uh, for dry powder inhalers don't have a good re record, let's put it that way, for particle size and deposition. So Is that pretty much true for pretty much all of them? <laughs> yeah, no, I think most of them, the highest penetrations are probably 20%, 25% uh, yeah. for particles. Because personally, I've never been all that impressed that this discus is a very efficient Deliver. I've always felt that anthrax discus would be a safe device. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, anthrax is not something you want to inhale, but if you put it in a device that's so inefficient that it doesn't get in, it's probably okay. safe. You know, therapeutic, no. Well, no, now I feel less bad about talking about pathologists and biopsies, <laughs> and biopsies at 4 a.m. So. And anthrax discus and is not an FDA approved right, no, product, by right. the way. label Right. This is this will be the part of the color that gets beeped out. Huh? Well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> what about uh, in? You know, we're in pediatric hospital. Uh, meter dose inhalers versus nebulizers. I mean, the, a lot of the pediatricians still insist that little kids have to use nebulizers, and a lot they're of, the uh, way to go. What, what a lot of asthma about? practitioners, both pulmonologists and allergists, especially the ones my age and older in terms of vintage. Um, they love to use nebulizers because it's the same thing with the dry powder and the discus. It's like once you put them on it, you think they're on automatic pilot. Mm -hmm. So if they're on a nebulizer, oh, that stuff's going to be forced into their lung. 
well, you know, 98% of it's going to be in their oral pharynx, uh, even with the best nebulizer. And even with the nebulizers, you know, we had that paper with Colin and Rohit Kadiol. I mean, depending on the flow you select, you know, you may have a machine that's b bad for the flow in terms of respirable particles. So yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty um, <laughs> dicey situation. I remember the one study that was done in National Jewish where they, they nebulized it until it started to sputter, and then they took the liquid out and found that most of the active ingredient was still, still in the liquid that hadn't yeah. actually been delivered. So you were basically delivering humidified air. Yeah, no, don't get me started on placebo effects here. I think that's where we're at. But My next lecture. The government is using into the, the sunset that kids here. Use, and it's not a very efficient delivery device. Nebulizers, no. Uh, again, it's the thing that makes parents feel confident that the medicine they're giving to their kids is getting there because they hear the whoosh and they see it, you know, rushing through the tube. Hmm. But in reality, it's it's uh, it's got its it's got its faults, so to speak. It's got its ins and outs. Right. Well, uh, any other comments or questions before we close this session? I hope I got the questions right for the CME. <laughs> <laughs> well, we really appreciate it, Dr. Rosenwasser. My pleasure. Um, so uh, we're going to stop here. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us on uh, Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, this conference is accredited by the Missouri State Medical Association for CME. Uh, it's been designated for uh, Category 1 AMA PRA. I don't know what PRA Category 1 credit is, uh, but physicians who uh, do go online and view this video and uh, answer the questions and fill out the, the survey can get CME, but please only claim claim credit to the extent of your participation. We're going to stop there. Have a great weekend, everyone, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.